Good afternoon. Happy Sunday. It's good to see you all. Um, I don't have any announcements other than uh, my denomination has an annual meeting. It's called the General Synod. And this year, I'm one of the representatives. So I'm leaving, I think, I think it's Wednesday, I'm leaving for a week. So next week, Chaplain Katie Kinnison uh, will be here with you on Sunday. And those are all the announcements I have. Are there any announcements that I'm forgetting? Anyone? Yes, there'll be Bible study. Uh, yes, there'll be Bible study. Well, you know, I was, Pat and I have been going back and forth. So we'll have Bible study this Tuesday. I'm looking at you and you. And then both of you will facilitate the following week. Yes, so there will be Bible study. Bible study will continue, which is great. Thank you for that. Thank you for that. Any other announcements? Yes. Everyone is moving to Rowan House on Thursday, on Tuesday the 13th. Okay. And uh, they don't want to have any visitors that day because they're removing furniture and all. So. Okay. But uh, it's going to be open on the 13th. It'll be open on the 13th, which will be not this week, but the following week. Yeah, so this is the transitional week. Families are moving in items, right? Some items, but uh, the, um, the residents won't move in until then. Okay, great. Thank you for that. Thank you for that. Any other announcements? Amen. All right. Well, let us worship God. Lower, you could lower that. Yeah. Let me help you with that. Oh, sure. No, I'm sorry, I forgot to. <laughs> Thank there you. You are welcome. Thank you. Okay. Uh, the call to worship is Psalm 8. O Lord, our sovereign, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory above the heavens. Out of the mouths of babes and infants, you have founded a bulwark because of your foes to silence the enemy and the avenger. When I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars that you have established, what are humans that you are mindful of them, mortals that you care for them? Yet you have made them a little lower than God and crowned them with glory and honor. You have given them dominion over the works of your hands. You have put all things under their feet. Will you pray with me, please? Mighty Lord, you reveal yourself as one God in three persons. Catch us up in your love and lead us into your world to call others to follow you with singing and rejoicing. We ask this through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. Will you join with me on hymn 414? Thank you. 
Please join me in the prayer of confession. God, who is three in one, we confess that we have turned away from you. God, our Father, teach us your truth. Holy Spirit, purify us from sin, transform us into faithful disciples who worship you alone. God who is Trinity, Amen. Let's pause for a moment of silent prayer. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. He will not always accuse, nor will he keep his anger forever. He does not deal with us according to our sins, nor repay us according to our iniquities. For as the heavens are high above the earth, so great is his steadfast love toward those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far he removes our transgressions from us. Friends, believe the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ, we are together. Thanks be to God. Let us share with each other the peace of Christ. What should we pray for today? Gene Ford stopped at my dais to express joy that the ducks had been born in the North Garden. There were nine eggs. It looks like they all are open. They're half of them. They're gone. So unless something else happens, they are open. Probably at the river. All right. Thank you for that. That's for Anna Fritz. She's in For Anna? Okay. What else should we pray for today? Yes. I couldn't hear what she said, but the opening of Rowan House and the trips, ease of transfer. Thank you. Yes, Mary Jo. Okay, thank you. What else should we pray for? Let's pray. In accord with God's command that we hold dominion over creation, let us pray for the church, the world, and all for whom we are called to be stewards. We give you thanks, O God, for our world, which you made and renewed in the power of Jesus' resurrection. Make us wise and careful of your gifts as we live on earth. We pray that the love which passes ceaselessly, ceaselessly between the Father and the Son in the fellowship of the Holy Spirit may renew and deepen the life of each Christian and draw us all into your unending life. For the leaders of the church, for Protestants, Roman Catholics, and the Orthodox, for Sunday school children and youth, for the elderly whose wise counsel is sorely needed in all ages, and for all ecumenical endeavors that seek to bring us closer to each other and to you, for earth and all creatures and plants, for healthy water and air and soil, for policies and laws that regard our home in God's universe as a precious gift, for our families, our households, and our communities, that your life together, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, may show us the like importance of each of us and to strengthen us 
in your grace and truth. For the sick and those who suffer in any way, for those who struggle to pay rent or a mortgage, for those who have no home, for those who are neglected and abused in our communities, for people who long for family and are instead alone, for children who do not have a good guide to raise them up, and for whatever else you see that we need. And Lord, we begin as we begin all things by giving you thanks and praise, Lord. We thank you for your grace and your mercy and your love. Lord, I lift up everyone here to you. Bless them. You know what's on their hearts. You know their needs and their desires, their pains and their joys. Lord, we lift up all the residents in Friendship Village. In a special way, we pray for our sisters and brothers in Waterford and um, Alderwood and soon our Rowan House, Lord. Bless them. We pray for all the associates and the work that they do, Lord. Lord, we pray for Anna Tripp, and we pray for Larry, Lord, as they undergo comfort care. Be with them at this stage of their journey. Fill their hearts and their rooms with your presence in a very special way, Lord. Give them a spirit of peace and encouragement. Lord, we pray for the transition in the Rowan House, Lord. We pray that all the people are preparing um, in a positive way, Lord, the workers. We pray for the families and the residents who are moving there, Lord, as they transition to the, this new stage in their lives, Lord. And Lord, we thank you, Lord, for the ducks that were born, and we give you thanks for that and the creation, and, and we just thank you for the joy and the gift of animals, Lord, and this earth. And so, Lord, we lift up all these prayers to you and the prayers that we keep silent in our hearts. In the name of Jesus, amen. Please join me in the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. Reading today is from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 28, verses 16 through 20. Whoopsie, sorry. <laughs> now the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountains to which Jesus had directed them. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but they doubted. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. And remember, I am with you always to the end of the age. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Oh, hymn 417. Jesus 
Today's reading is the final paragraph in the Gospel of Matthew. Jesus has been resurrected from the dead. Word has gone out that Jesus' body was not in the tomb. The stone that blocked the entrance to the tomb was rolled back. Mary Magdalene and her friend, the other Mary, probably Mary of Clopas, went to look at the tomb just to lay their eyes on where Jesus was put to rest. They couldn't get past the guards. They just wanted to stand at the foot of the entrance, just as we sometimes stand at a burial site or a cemetery or a columbarium or by the urn of ashes. We do so when we visit a holy site, a place of pilgrimage. Perhaps there's a place in nature that brings us closer to God. And we do this because we wish to be in the presence of a sacred memory, in the presence of something good and right and holy. When we go to a holy place, whether in geography or in our hearts, we want to stand in the presence of God, of the eternal. And this is why we make this weekly pilgrimage from our homes to this place, this place which is made sacred for it, it, uh, God draws us together to be with him. We read in Exodus 3, God called to him out of the bush, Moses, Moses, And he said, here I am. And then he said, come no closer. Remove the sandals from your feet, for the place on which you are standing is holy ground. These two women wanted to stand on holy ground. And we join them today by removing the dirt, the muddiness, the anxieties, and the doubts in our hearts and stand on holy ground. Every time we gather together, we are removing the sandals from our feet. And we stand side by side with Mary Magdalene and the other Mary. And we face the tomb where Jesus laid. But we know how the story ends. It's as if I want to whisper in the ears of Mary, uh, Jesus has risen from the dead. But I don't want to spoil her surprise. I want them to experience the fullness of the moment. And when they arrive, there is confusion. Something is strange here. Something is different here. There's a violent earthquake. The guards are in a state of shock at what they are experiencing. An angel appears and rolls back the stone that blocked the entrance. And the angel casually sits on the stone and says, do not be afraid. I know you are looking for Jesus. He's not here. He's been raised. Come, see the place where he lay. And like a dream, they walk into the tomb, and all they see are the strips of linen that wrapped a dead man three days ago. And when they come out of the tomb, they are forever changed. My friends, when we embrace Christ and follow him, it is as if we enter the tomb carrying all our wounds and brokenness and worries and anxieties, and sins and hurts, and we leave there transformed. What was dead in our hearts is now alive. The strips of linen that always seems to return and wraps itself around us so tightly 
that it paralyzes us, that chokes us with fear and doubt and anxiety and angst, are loosened and fall to the ground by the love of Christ. Sometimes, because life is life, we take for granted the amazing story and work of Jesus Christ in our lives. We take for granted the wonder of God in our lives. But every day when we wake up is a new earthquake, a transformation in our hearts. And then we read, now the 11 disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. In the past, the disciples would follow a man whom they called Lord and Master, whom they hoped would lead the liberation of the Jewish people from their oppression, the man whose words give eternal life. In John 6, Jesus is, uh, explains how he is the bread of heaven, and we read, when many of his disciples heard it, they said, this teaching is too difficult. Who can accept it? But Jesus, being aware that his disciples were complaining about it, said to them, does this offend you? Then what if you were to see the Son of God ascending to where he was before? It is the Spirit that gives life. The flesh is useless. The words that I have spoken to you are spirit and life. But among you, there are some who do not believe. My friends, there will be those who do not believe. There will be those who leave the faith, perhaps for a little while, perhaps for a journey, perhaps for a lifetime. And maybe in our own lives, there have been moments when we haven't believed. And maybe even now, there are moments when we doubt. What do we do then? What do we do when someone doubts? What do we do when we doubt? I think the answer is found in 1 Corinthians 13. Love is patient, love is kind, love is not envious or boastful or arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way, it is not irritable, it keeps no record of wrongs, it does not rejoice in wrongdoings but rejoices in the truth. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. But as for prophecies, they will come to an end. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will come to an end. For we know only in part, and we prophesy only in part, but when the complete comes, the partial will come to an end. When I was a child, I spoke like a child, I thought like a child, I reasoned like a child. When I became an adult, I put an end to childish ways. For now, we see only a reflection, as in a mirror. But then, we will see face to face. Now, I know only in part. Then, I will know fully, even as I have been fully known. And now, faith, hope, and love remain. These three, and the greatest of these is love. My friends, when these moments of doubt emerge, let us do what these words say. Let us simply love. Love others and be gentle with our doubts. As for Paul writes, we only see a reflection as in a mirror, but then we will see face to face. Now I know only in part. Then I will know fully even as I have been fully known. We don't have all the answers. We only know a part of it. And the small part is a feast. That small part is more than enough. That small part can fill our hearts for a lifetime. We can't possibly understand the fullness and the mystery of God. We only see a reflection as in a mirror. And when you look in the mirror, that steamed up, opaque, muddy, cataract, painful mirror of life, looking back at you, is the face of God who loves you. Thomas the Apostle questioned and doubted, but he continued to follow Jesus. He only knew in part, but had faith that he would eventually know fully and be fully known. Our poor brother Judas was lost. He was so lost that he decided to end his life rather to continue and trust the path of Christ. In today's passage, we read, now the 11 disciples went to Galilee, 
to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. But when they saw him, they worshipped him, but they doubted. Even though they doubted, they continued to follow Christ. Let this be a model for us. During moments of doubt, continue to follow Jesus. Speak to him. Ask him your questions. Scream your doubts. There is nothing you will say with your lips or with your hearts that he hasn't heard before. He understands, for in our religion, God became one of us and understands our existential struggles. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Christ said those terrifying words in Matthew 27 and in Mark 15 when he was dying. Our God understands. My friends, I'm here to tell you that during moments and seasons of doubts and questioning, keep loving people and keep walking with Jesus. Keep reading the stories about him. Keep reading his beautiful words. He understands the struggles. And let today's reading be an encouragement to us. Before the resurrection, the disciples walked with Jesus only with the hope that he was the Messiah. Now they are walking with the resurrected Christ. And even then they doubted. We read when they saw him, they worshipped him, but they doubted. And maybe that's you today. You worship him, but you have questions and doubts. Conversely, you question and doubt, but here you are. Because there is something here that is meaningful and inspiring and loving and comforting and forgiving and peaceful. After Jesus spoke about being the bread of life, uh, we read, Because of this, many of his disciples turned back and no longer went about with him. Jesus is watching people, was watching people walk away. And then he turned to the 12 apostles and asked them directly, do you also wish to go away? And in the moment of that question, in the moment of doubt, Peter gives the most perfect response. Lord, to whom can we go? You have the words of eternal life. My friends, I want to encourage you during times of doubt to continue to walk with Jesus to come to Christian fellowship, to sing the hymns, to listen to Christian music, to pray the prayers, to reflect and ponder the things of God and the words of Jesus, to process your questions with one another. And if that vulnerability makes you uncomfortable, visit with me. I will likely not have answers, but it'll be a safe space for us to wonder together. Cloak yourself with the things and traditions the church has passed on for 2,000 years. Now, let's be honest. Sometimes the church and Christians drive us crazy, and it leads us to question and doubt. And sometimes the church and Christians are wonderful, and it leads us to gratitude. For as long as there are human beings in the church, it will be crazy and wonderful. Mahatma Gandhi famously said, I like your Christ. I do not like your Christians. Your Christians are so unlike your Christ. (laughs) My friends, this is my plea. Don't throw out the baby with the bathwater. Moments and seasons of questioning and doubt are the perfect time to read the four Gospels and just to listen to the teachings of Jesus. Filter out the noise of distractions and just read and reflect and contemplate the words of Jesus. And perhaps before you begin reading, quietly say to yourself like a mantra, Lord, to whom can we go? You have the words of eternal life. My friends, if these 11 disciples who doubted are in heaven now, then there is hope for all of us. Amen? For even in their doubt, they continue to worship Jesus and continue to follow him. I am reminded of the man in Mark 9 who brought his son to Jesus to be healed. A father who was broken and frustrated with a lifetime of trying to help his sick son. 
And Jesus said to him, if you are able, all things can be done for the one who believes. And this poor man cries out and perfectly captures what believers feel during moments and seasons of frustration and questioning and doubt. He says, I believe, help my unbelief. I believe, help my unbelief. My friends, let that be our prayer during times of doubt. Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. I believe, help my unbelief. Amen. just realized I don't have the words on the screen for the response, so please bear with me. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give God our thanks and praise. It is good and right and a joyful thing to give you thanks and praise always and everywhere, O God Almighty. We bless you for your continual love and care for every creature. We praise you for forming us in your image and for calling us to be your people. You sent us prophets and teachers to guide us on the journey. Above all, we give you thanks for the gift of Jesus, who is the way and the truth and the life, who took on human form to live and die as one of us. We thank you for the Holy Spirit who leads us into truth, defends us in adversity, and gathers us from every people to unite us in one holy church. Therefore, with the entire company of saints, in all places and all times, we praise you with joy, saying together, Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Send your Holy Spirit upon us, we pray, that the bread which we break and the juice that we drink may be to us the communion of the body and blood of Christ. Grant that being joined together in him, we may attain to the unity of the faith and grow up in all things into him, Christ our Lord. As this grain has been gathered from many fields into one loaf and these grapes from many hills into one cup, Grant, O Lord, that your whole church may soon be gathered from the ends of the earth into your kingdom. On the night he was betrayed, the Lord Jesus took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, he took the cup, saying, Take, drink, this is the cup of the new covenant in my blood. Do this in remembrance of me. The bread we eat and the cup we drink is the communion of the body and blood of Christ.
body of Christ. The body of Christ. The body of Christ. Take and eat. This is the body of Christ broken for us. Take and drink. This is the cup of the new covenant poured out for us. Gracious God, we give you thanks for the gift of our Savior's presence in the simplicity of this holy meal. You have fed us with the bread of life and renewed us for your service. Send us now into the world in peace. Grant us strength and courage to love and serve you with gladness and singleness of heart. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. My friends, please join us in singing hymn 430, Standing on the Promises.
May the Lord bless us and keep us. May the Lord's face shine upon us and be gracious to us. May the Lord protect us from all anxiety and bring us to everlasting life. Amen. Go forth to love and serve the Lord.